I cherish this opportunity to, for another time, uh, address God's people in this part of the vineyard over whom the Holy Spirit has given me this great responsibility. And I'm almost certain that I have no doubt what the Lord will have me to preach to us this morning, a message that means so much to me, and I know it will be the same to you. My subject is living in the presence of God. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we are so privileged that we can come into your presence this morning and sup with you and you with us and enable us to become like you in character. We thank you for your grace and your sustenance. We thank you for your word that is able to make us wise unto salvation. We pray, O oh God, this morning that you will not deal gently with us today, but through your words and by your spirit, you will lead us into deeper concentration and meditation of thee. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us in a special way. You'll teach us, guide us, and instruct us. And may the principle of the Most High God inspire us to thy infinite wisdom and mercy we beg of thee. We pray, Lord, for the light of revelation and illumination, and that revelation glory will not be intercepted by demonic forces, but it will envelope this place with your glory. Tailor the text to meet thy need, O God, and we will be quick to give you the praise and the honor and the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Praise the Lord. Let me begin by saying, it is not a complicated thing in life that gives you the most trouble. It is a simple thing that you know to do that gives you the most trouble, like walking in the light that you have received. For no man is guilty of a sin unless he goes against the light of his own conscience. Acts 17, 30 say, in the time of ignorance, God wink. He that cannot read is no better than he that doesn't read. Similarly, he that has a key is no better than he who hasn't got a key. If he who has a key doesn't know what a key is for or how to use the key. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, God has given us the key to the kingdom of God. Whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Many of us do not know what that key is. Many of us have the key and do not know what the key is. In verse 18 of Matthew chapter 16, you see, Christ said to Peter, he said, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Upon the confession that thou art the Christ, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My church, singular, possessive, pronoun. He has a church. But God's church is not a great cathedral. It is not a national establishment. Neither is your denomination. That might shock you. Neither is it your organization. It is those who love the Lord and keep his commandments. Acts of the Apostles, page 11, says, Faithful souls constitute his church. And I am privileged this morning to address God's church this morning. Amen? Amen. God's church this morning. Good to be here. Praise the Lord. The evangelizing message of the Seventh-day Adventist church comprises of two complementary and inseparable components. The spiritual soul winning dimension and the social soul winning dimension. And it must not be separated and it should not be separated. To emphasize one to the neglect of the other is a tragic denial of genuine Adventism. As a prophetic church with a unique global message, it is imperative that we keep the social and the redemptive responsibility of the church in constant balance, not emphasizing one to the neglect of the other. You see, the church cannot expect dramatic Pentecostal result in evangelism while fishing in unproductive shallow water of human effort. Lack of sacrificial commitment and Laodicean lukewarmness and spiritual complacency. The church is commissioned to launch out into the deep. According to Luke chapter 5, the deep, the word deep is descriptive of the overflowing population yet to be reached with the redemptive message of the everlasting gospel. The deep encompasses the masses as well as the elite, the aristocrat, the upper class and the lower class, the middle class and the classless, the haves and the have not, the free and the bong, the rich and the poor, the sick and the dying. We, have to, we are commissioned to reach everybody on the top low side of the earth. But there was a problem. Here comes a problem. There was this fallacy of salvation without human involvement that is circularizing among us that all we need to do is to come to church, sit down and we're going to be saved. It's a fallacy, it's a lie, it's a deception. 
Permit me to set the record straight this morning that salvation is absolutely and exclusively a product of divine grace plus nothing, minus nothing. From start to finish, salvation is God's supreme redemptive act. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you are saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourself, least any man should boast. It is a gift from God. Watch me. Grace comes from God. Faith we must have in God to accept the grace of God. For grace is the cause of salvation, but faith is the condition of salvation. To be saved, you must have faith in God. That statement raises a fundamental question, that which is often grossly misunderstood by many. If salvation is absolutely a product of divine grace, what part does man play in God's salvation act? Is it biblically accurate to conclude that man is a passive, uninvolved subject in God's salvation act? Is it? No, salvation to be effective must have man's 100% participation. Man cannot be saved by passively doing nothing. In other words, that's the easiest way to be lost. Come to church, sit down, listen to a message, and do nothing. The prophets say, in order for God's grace to become your grace, you must act your part. God gives his grace to do unto will of his own good pleasure, but never a substitute for your effort. She said, even though the sinner cannot save himself, there is still something he has to do to secure his salvation. I want you to understand that the robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. It's all about God. But in God's salvation act, the process of believing, choosing, and accepting, they are man's responsibility. And God will not do that for you. What he does, however, he gives his enabling grace to facilitate the decision. But the decision is exclusively man's prerogative, man's choice, man's decision. Where do you want to spend your eternity? You decide that, not God. That might shock you. Hence, salvation in a strict sense is 100% of God's work and 100% of man's response. Where do you want to spend your eternity? You decide that, not God. Let me back up a little bit to get your attention, to introduce this message. John said, the prophet says, let Revelation speak, let Daniel speak, and tell what is truth. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1, John said he saw in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne a book written therein and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And he said he saw a strong man proclaiming with a loud voice saying, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seven seals? And no one was found in heaven, nor on the earth, nor beneath the earth was worthy to open the book and read the book therein. And I, John, wept much. But one of the elders said, John, weep not for the lion out of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. The roots of David have prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seas. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. And when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. 1755. And the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. 1780. And the stars fell from heaven, 1833, and the fig tree cast into an untimely fig, and she was shaken by a mighty wind. And the Bible says the heavens departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of its places. And the kings of the earth, and the chief captain, and the mighty men, and the free men, and the bong men, they all hid themselves in the den, and in the rocks of the mountain, saying to the rocks of the mountain, Fall on us, and hide us from him who sat upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come. Here comes the troublesome question in verse 17. Who shall be able to stand in those days? Who shall be able to stand in those days? Revelation 77. John said... So four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds that it shall not blow on the tree and the sea and the earth. And John said he saw another angel arising from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried mightily unto the four angels who were commissioned to hurt the earth. Say, hurt not the earth, not the sea, not the tree. Still I seal my servant upon their forehead. Intellectually settling into the present truth. Revelation 14, 1, John said, Lo, I look, and a lamb stood upon Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. His name is his character. His character is the law. 
in the light of all the above mentioned, Christians are to be prepared for what is soon to break out upon this earth in an overwhelming surprise. And that preparation should be made by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform our life to its precepts. The tremendous issue of eternity demands something much more than an imaginable religion. A religion in form and in words where the truth is left out into the outer court. God calls for revival and reformation to that of primitive godliness that has not been witnessed since the apostolic time. To seek this should be our first work. If we are to remain with this movement, there must be a revival. Otherwise, we will not be with it. There are many of us who believe that we are God's children and we are part of this movement. But until the plague begins to fall, you're going to recognize you are not part of this movement. And But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. God's church is not an organization. God's church is a movement. It is not an institution. It's a movement. The organization and the institution is to assist God's church. But God's church is not an institution. And as a result, the church has become so institutionalized with temple mentality, trying to serve a sanctuary God. I got news for you this morning. Jesus Christ is in the sanctuary. He's conducting the last phase, the final phase of the atonement. And he says in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, he said, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out in the time of refreshing and God will send Jesus. The time of refreshing is the latter rain. It's upon us. Jesus is about to come. Is either your sins be blotted out or is either your names be blotted out? The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Here comes the troublesome question. Here comes the question. Why will God say to church members, religious people, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 2, that 50% will not make it into the kingdom of God? Let me get some context. Let's go back to verse 1. The kingdom of God is like one of the ten virgins which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Watch me now. 50% wise and 50% foolish. Verse 12. The 50 foolish one came knocking at the door. Lord, would you open up unto me? And he said, I knew you not. Why would God say to religious people, church members, in Matthew chapter 7, verse, 20, verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me. Let's get some context here. Go back to verse 21. He said, not all who said, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father. The prophet said, the will of God is expressed in the precept of his holy law. Many will say to me, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? Who is that talking about? That is talking about leadership. We pro I'm prophesying, I'm foretelling, I'm forewarning. Mm -hmm. huh? Many will say, Lord, have I not cast out demons? Who does that? Lord, have I not done great and wonderful things? He said, I never knew you. You know the rest of the story. Why would God say it in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 2, I knew you not? Why would God say in Matthew chapter 7 verse, verse 23, I never knew you? You see the word new come from a, a, a Greek word genesco, but it comes from a Hebrew word yada. It implies an in intimate abiding relationship. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1 that Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Intimate relationship. Down to verse 17, it says, he says, and Cain knew his wife and she conceived. In other words, we have come to church, but we have never had an intimate, abiding relationship with Jesus. Let me pause there to bring in something here. You know, the gospel has two parts. We often emphasize one to the neglect of the other. The gospel has two parts. The person of Jesus and the principle of Jesus. The person of Jesus creates your peace. Romans 5.1, justification by faith. You are peace with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But the principle of Jesus creates your prosperity. Isaiah 1.19 says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. So you can be very religious, but you are also poor. Because you are not applying the principle, which is the law of God. The person of Jesus gives you the assurance. Matthew 14, 13, whatsoever you ask the Father in the name of Jesus, I'm going to give it unto you. 
But the principle of Jesus created protection. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 8 says, He that digged a hole shall fall in it, but he that breaketh a hedge, serpent shall bite him. The prophet says in obedience to God's law, man is surrounded by a hedge that protects him from evil. He that break down that divinely erected barrier causes evil to invade him. Without the law, there was no gospel. And without the gospel, you cannot keep the law. The law is a gospel. Huh? You cannot do away with one to the neglect of the other. One is a root, the other one is a fragrant, the blossom and the fruits. Why would God say to church members, I never knew you? In relation to my subject, living in the presence of God, because you have come to church, but you have never come into the presence of God. You see, you can only come into the presence of God with the presence of God. You didn't hear what I'm saying this morning. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19, verse 20, he said, where two and three are gathered in the midst and there, that is talking about the family circle and by extension, the church. But when you come into the presence of God, when you come into the corporate assembly to worship God, you must come with the presence of God in you. Know you not in 1 Corinthians 1, 3, 16 and 1 Corinthians 3, 6, 3, 6, 19 say, Know you not that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So when you come into the corporate assembly, you are coming with the presence of God in you. I, I heard a question. How do you know the presence of God is in you? John 14, 23. I love that text. Here what he says. He says, if you love me, you will keep my words. And my father will love you. And we will come and make our abode in you. Notice something. It's not only Jesus coming in. The father and the son is coming to make their abode in you by their spirit. But you've got to do what he says. And if you're not doing what he says... Then he's not living in you. Let me, let me tell you something. If you read John, John chapter 16, John chapter 17, and look at verse 6, verse 4. Jesus said to the father, father, I have finished my work. What is it? Look at verse 6. He said, I have given, I have manifested thy name. Look at verse 8. He said, I gave them my word. And they believe it and they kept it. I will show it a part of life. Where? In my presence. There is a fullness of joy and at my right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. That man is Adam. Adam. The word Adam, the root meaning of the word Adam means Adama, means earth. A dirt, but the word Adam means to be red. It seems as though God made Adam with red dirt, ruby red. You, you, you see the, 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 the word Adam comes from three Hebrew letters, Aleph, Delete, and Mem. In the very name Adam carry his responsibility. You see in every Hebrew letter there is a pictograph and there is a numerical number. The, 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 the pictograph, because Alif is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Alif is number one. Alif is symbolized by a bull head, strength, leader. God designated him to be the leader, the head of the home. Dalit is a door, he's a doorman. He determines what comes into the house and what should leave the house. And Mem is water, according to John 7, 38 and 39. Water is the symbolism of the Holy Spirit. Adam's responsibility, he is the head, he is the leader, he is the doorman. He determines what comes in, what goes out. He is a surround, every evil, every evil, every forbidden thing, every illicit thing, surrounded by the Holy Spirit and wash it away. Adam didn't do that. That's why we're in a mess. But in verse 8, Verse 8, the Bible says, God planted a garden east in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. 
You see the word Eden is a complicated word. It means a spot. It means a delightful spot. It means an open door. It means the presence of God. So the first thing that God gave Adam was not a woman. That might shock you. The first thing that God gave Adam was his presence. Everything that God gave Adam in the Garden of Eden is to keep him in God's presence. The word Eden is another complicated word. It comes from three Hebrew letters. Ayin, Dalit, and Nun. Ayin is a sea, symbolized by your eye, to see, to know. Dalit, by the door, the path, or the way. And Nun is symbolized by a fish or kingdom. In other words, look, look, it, it tells a story. The, the Hebrew is so powerful. It tells us, you know, when you are in the presence of God, you can see the path. To the kingdom. When you are in the presence of God, you can know the way of life. And that is exactly what the Bible says in, in, in Psalm 1611. I will show you the part of life where in my presence there was the fullness of joy and at my right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In other words, that tells, text tells me you don't determine who you are or what you are. You're in, nobody is not saying anything to me. You don't determine who you are or what you are. You discovered who you are. And God gave you gifts to fulfill your mission. And Romans chapter 11 verse 29 says, God gifts is irrevocable. When he gives you a gift to complete your mission, he doesn't take it back. You don't, dis you don't determine who you are. You discovered who you are. You see, none of us here is by any accident. We are here by divine providence. God sees a problem and he sent you to solve the problem. And if you are not solving the problem, you become a problem for somebody else to solve. You don't determine who you are. You discover who you are and that takes revelation. You see, revelation, the same word for revelation, the Bible says in, in, in Proverbs 29, where there is no vision, the people perish. The same word in the Hebrew for revelation is the same word for vision. Where there is no revelation to people, where there is no vision to people perish. In other words, you get revelation by worshiping God. Oh, you didn't hear what I'm saying this morning. You get revelation by worshiping God. You see, it is worship that sustains the sovereignty existence of God. For when God inhales worship, he exhales revelation. And the proportion of your revelation is in direct symmetry to the proportion of your worship. That is to say that the more you worship God, is the more God reveals himself to you. And the dynamics, the dynamics of the revelation you receive from God is to bring you into deeper dimension with the Lord Jesus Christ. For life is lived on levels, experience on stages, but established on dimensions. We exchange Worship for revelation. When you worship God, he will direct you. He will direct you the career to pursue, the person to marry, the house to buy, where to live, the car to buy. He said, I will show you the part of life, but you've got to come into my presence. Look how serious that is. Listen, when Moses, God gave Moses instruction in the book of Exodus chapter 33. Look at verse 15 and verse 14. Let me go to verse 15. God gave Moses the instruction and Moses said, Lord, if your presence is not going with me, don't take me up there. In other words, I'm not going. And verse 14 said, Lord said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Pillar by cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is God's presence with him. Look at David, look at David. David, a, man, a mighty man of God, a sweet singer of Israel. He found himself in a situation he had sinned and he went and cried out in Psalm chapter 51 and verse 10. He said, Lord created me a clean heart and renewed that right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy present, but restore unto me the joy of full salvation in Jesus. Cast me not away from thy presence. We must be continuously be living in the presence of God. God has given man in the Garden of Eden three institutions to keep us in his presence. God gave us a home, the family. Huh? That the man will be stable. That the woman will be stable. To stay in the presence of God. Huh? 
God gave, God gave man the Sabbath. Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. The Sabbath to keep us in his presence. You notice sometimes when somebody wants to slip away from the presence of God, they stop coming to the church on Sabbath. Huh? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. God gave the garden. And by the way, God gave man two gardens in the Garden of Eden. Two gardens. To cultivate two gardens. You know about one. <laughs> I'm going to show you another one. And in the Bible that God gave man two gardens to cultivate. It's a cultivated. Bring out the best in it. Maxi maximize the potential of the garden. Bring out the best. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Huh? God gave man labor. Labor is an institution. It was not given after sin. It was given before sin. Huh? And that's why we see, we see even the women in the church, they are marrying to a man who has no job in the church. The only place that marriage come before, huh? Wedding? Well, let me leave that alone. <laughs> All right, but brothers and sisters, God gave man three institutions, the home. God gave the Sabbath. God gave labor to keep man in subjection, keep him in his presence. Not only that, look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. God gave man the law. It's a hedge to protect him from evil, to keep him in his presence. Hmm? But you know, in marriage, in verse 18, verse 18, God gave man the woman. What a blessing. Thank God for Eve. Oh, by the way, this is my beloved wife in whom I'm well pleased. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I can say that for over 42 years. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. God gave man Eve as a help meet. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Why do, did God give man a helper? When the man is a counselor, he's a priest, the provider, the counselor, the guide, the lover. Why did God give man a helper? How, 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 why is it that a man need a help? When he's a counselor, the guide, the priest, the provider, the lover. Huh? Because God knows best. Amen. And any man who believes he's macho and he knows everything and he doesn't need the counsel of his wife always makes stupid decision. Come on, women, I'm helping you all. Say amen. amen. Always makes stupid decision. When I discovered, you see, because God has given the woman a gift, brothers and sisters, a gift of intuition, a gift to make an immediate intellectual analysis of a situation or a person or place or thing without prior knowledge. God gave them that gift. When I discovered that everything I want to do, I say, ask my wife, what do you think? Should I pass so? Should I go so? Should I buy this? I pass it by heart. Take advantage on that. Amen? Yeah, God gave man his laws. God gave that man the woman. You see the, 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 the man, let me show you the other garden. The other garden is that the man is the, he's the progenitor. He's a walking warehouse of seeds. The woman is the incubator. Everything the man gives the woman, she incubated, multiplied, and gave it back to him. Amen? Amen? If the man gives the woman a sentence, she will give him a paragraph. If he give her sperm, she'll give him a what? A baby, right? If, she give, if he give her love, she will give him submission. By the way, men interpret submission to be love. Ephesians 5.25, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify by the washing of the water by the words, that he might present it unto himself a glorious church. But if he give her an attitude, she's going to give him hell. <laughs> oh, they have a gift in doing that. So listen to me, man, carefully. By, by, by the way, you see the woman is the production of a man's cultivation. 
He is a plant seed into her. He is a cultivate that garden, that woman. Cultivate her into the image that he, God will have her, him to do. So that she'll bring, her, he, bring out the best in her. Don't take her for granted. Amen? Don't take her for granted at all. So the woman is the production of a man's cultivation. What are you planting? Is just exactly what you're going to get. So don't complain about something that you're not modeling. Amen. Sarah call Abraham Lord. Are, are you with me out there? So be careful what you plant is exactly what she's going to give back to you. She just multiplied and gave it back to you. And then you are complaining, but not knowing is exactly what you gave her. She's giving you back. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Christ is coming again. Christ is coming again. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a what? Weakness to all nations. As a weakness to all nations. And then shall he come. The kingdom of God. The word kingdom means rules and realm and royalty. In other words, the good news of the rule of God shall be proclaimed to all nations. All ethnic group. As a weakness. And then shall he, the end come. The word weakness comes from a, a Greek word. Matarioi. It means one who produced the evidence. In other words, you must preach the gospel until it becomes ethnic evidence. Let me say this, brothers and sisters. Death is not what makes you a martyr. Death is the evidence that you're not willing to give up what you believe to the point of death. Amen? So you've you got to produce the evidence. Where are the evidence in the church that you have been with Jesus? Where are the evidence? We got to proclaim the gospel until it becomes ethnic evidence. It, 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 it must show evidence that you have been with Jesus. Amen. Where are the evidence? On a job, in your home, in the workplace, on the streets, you must show evidence that you have been with Jesus. Amen. What do you think? Amen. Oh, let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the admonition and counsel we have received this morning. Grant, oh Father, these truths will stamp upon our souls and woven into our daily lives so that it will have sanctifying effect upon our character. Bless your people, Lord, fathers and mothers and children. Bless the home from whence they came. May the Spirit of God move into the homes and bring peace and, and, and security and deliverance. We pray for those who are sick here this morning, who came. They must have the courage to be here. Heart ache and back ache and foot ache and kidney problem. We pray, Lord, you are still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, who can deliver. There is nothing too hard for God, for you are way in the wilderness and you are water in dry land. If there is no way, you can make a way. We pray for the age among us, Lord, as David cried out, Lord, forsake not me when I get old. Help us, Lord, that the church will not forsake those age among us who have worked so hard and contribute so much to the church. Let us not cast them aside, but remember them to help them. We pray for the little ones, Father. You see, you will contend with those who contend with us, and you will save our children. Oh, Father, be with us today. Be with us, church. We have a beautiful edifice here. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Give us the desire, Lord, to put some stars on our crown. And when time shall, shall be no more, and the eastern sky should burst, and Jesus Christ descended with power and great revelation glory. Help every one of us who are here, and for those in whom we shall labor, our friends and our family and our co-workers, be in that great number when the saints go marching in. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. amen. Come and let the church say hallelujah. Amen. Let the church show glory. glory. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord.